Okay, let's get going. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, our own Jason Hogan, who will give the colloquium. Uh, Jason was a graduate student here at Stanford. He graduated in 2010. He worked in Mark Kasevich's lab um, on the 10 meter tower experiment in the basement of Varian. I actually knew him uh, back when he was the only student on that experiment and there was nothing in the lab <laughs> except maybe some uh, stuff to be cleaned out. Um, uh, and he helped, uh, with many other people, helped build it up to a great apparatus which is, I think, still producing uh, fantastic results to this day. Uh, Jason started as faculty here in 2014. And I think it's fair to say his uh, biggest focus has been on building a new type of gravitational wave detector using atomic interferometry. Uh, Jason really pioneered this approach. Uh, and he has been uh, focused on uh, developing all the technology um, and he started and is still leading a major international collaboration uh, designed to build this uh, new type of detector. The first iteration of this detector will be at Fermilab uh, and it's been actually really fascinating for me to see uh, how Jason has put together uh, people from the more particle and accelerator side and from the atomic physics side. Uh, you sort of really needed um, expertise from, from those communities to build what will be um, soon a very large, or let's say by atomic physics standards, a very large uh, detector. So that's what uh, Jason will tell us about today. Great. Well, thank you, Peter. And uh, I should say, Peter has also played a big role in everything he just said. So um, it's been a good, good collaboration. Uh, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you all about what we've been up to. So um, I'll be telling you about this uh, new field, I guess you could say, that's emerging, which we call uh, long baseline atom interferometry. And uh, I've stuck the word clock in there uh, as, as sort of our specialization. We'll, we'll, um, I'll, I'll tell you about sort of three topics in this, in this area today. Um, we'll talk about this field of, uh, of long baseline atom interferometry and, and this Magus 100 project that Peter did a great job of, introduc of introducing for me. And um, some, of the, uh, sort of the, some of the science goals that, and, and that, that uh, we, we aim to, uh, to, to, uh, to do with this detector, uh, Peter already alluded to. Um, and so I'll tell you about how we can use these sorts of long baseline quantum sensors uh, to detect gravitational waves and, and search for dark matter. And then uh, finally, hopefully we'll have time. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about one of the areas of technology improvement that I think was also alluded to. In addition to you know, making things bigger, which is kind of the spirit of these long baseline sensors, we're trying to scale up what's historically been a tabletop field uh, of, of, of quantum sensing, uh, sort of small scale apparatus. We're trying to scale these, these, these devices up uh, so that they can really qualify for the term long baseline. Um, in addition to that, there's sort of work on the, uh, the sensitivity of the uh, of, of, of these atom interferometers, and I'll tell you about um, one direction in, in that uh, area that we're pushing, so-called large momentum transfer um, atom optics, and some recent results from my group, uh, kind of pushing uh, sort of the, the, the frontier there. Um, that, that'll be once again part of this story of trying to scale these devices up, not just in terms of size but also sensitivity, um, so they can do this science that we're so excited to do. Um, so. First though, let me take a step back and kind of broadly introduce why this is, um, I think, an interesting area to even think about in the first place. So I've got here um, a, a sort of a cartoon of atomic clock and an atom interferometer. And these, these are uh, examples of quantum sensors and they're really closely related. So um, the, the atom interferometer and atomic clock uh, sort of approaches. So this is a, maybe like an optical lattice clock. So this is this uh, sort of um, standing wave potential you see there um, is an optical standing wave trapping um, atoms in this array. And this is the technique that's used uh, now to make some of the best clocks in the world. And so just to put that in perspective would be quantitative. Um, the best atomic clocks now achieve sort of uh, fractional frequency stability of basically 10 to the minus 18 or better. So that's, uh, if you put that into time units, if you were to convert that frequency resolution into time uncertainty, it would be like losing uh, one second or have an error of one second over the lifetime of the universe. So just incredible timing precision that, uh, that's now possible or, or frequency resolution that you, that's now possible with atomic clock technology. And, uh, and atom interferometers are, 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 um, are, are, are sort of can benefit from that same sorts of sensitivity. And uh, the question I'd like us to think about or that I'm interested in thinking about is how do we essentially exploit that incredible uh, precision that's now possible and, uh, and, and apply it to some of these um, fundamental physics ideas like gravitational wave detection. Um, and so 
the kind of at the heart of, of both of these uh, technologies uh, that, that I'll tell you about is um, the existence of really narrow atomic transitions. So this is a, a level diagram of the strontium atom that's used in some of these best atomic clocks. And I've sort of indicated here uh, this special transition, uh, which is, have, has a very long lived excited state, lives for over 100 seconds, this excited state, on an optical transition. So it's 698 nanometers in strontium 87. And so since that uh, state is so long lived, you can have a very long coherence time if you put the atom in a superposition of those two states. And that's sort of um, the, the essence of, of how you get such good, uh, good, good precision with uh, these atomic clocks. And what we'd like to do, what, we, what, what my group has been working on for the last number of years, is trying to translate that um, to, the, uh, to an atom interferometer, where instead of measuring time, we're looking for things like really small forces or accelerations. Um, and this cartoon shows a, uh, uh, a, a, a sort of a three pulse um, a Mach Zender atom interferometer, and I'll say more about that in, in a few minutes. Um, but the, the key thing just to point out here is that there's sort of two different atomic levels, one and two, which would in this case correspond to the two levels of the strontium atom. And so we're going to basically be using that same narrow line transition to try to measure really small forces and, and maybe look for things like gravitational waves. Okay, so, um, and, and, and maybe in a little bit more detail, this is a, uh, um, a list of some of the big science uh, goals that I, I, I think uh, would, 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 would highlight for these long baseline quantum sensors. Um, so first, gravitational waves. Uh, and, 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 and I think um, I don't have to sell too much on, on, on or talk too much about how exciting gravitational waves as a field has, has become. We've, we've all seen the uh, amazing results coming out of LIGO uh, already. And I think that, that, that we have really just bega begun this new uh, sort of uh, um, window into, in, into the universe using gravitational wave science. Um, but much like uh, we have different kinds of telescopes in, in, in the electromagnetic uh, arena, so we have X-ray and, and, and radio and optical and all these different technologies that are suited for looking for, um, for, for, uh, for signals in electromagnetic waves at different wavelengths, and there's different information we can learn in each of those bands, the same is true in the gravitational wave spectrum. And so LIGO uh, is, is, is um, operating at, at, at sort of higher frequencies, above 10 hertz. And what I'll be telling you about today is, is sort of a technology using, using long baseline atom sensors that could look for lower frequencies uh, in sort of this so-called mid-band range, uh, sort of a fraction of a hertz to a few hertz. Uh, and that turns out to be a really exciting frequency range uh, for a number of reasons. I've got a few um, sources listed here, I, which I'll, I'll, uh, I won't spend too much time on. I, I will come back to the, the, uh, this idea of multi-messenger astronomy in a minute. So just hold, hold that thought. Um, also, uh, as I've mentioned now, uh, we can use this same technology. In fact, the, the exact same sensor configuration that can look for gravitational waves, it sort of simultaneously can look for uh, certain kinds of dark matter. And so here I have in mind sort of ultralight, so-called ultralight uh, dark matter that acts in a wave-like way. Uh, so it is distinct from sort of particle-like dark matter. So this is sort of um, very low masses, sort of in the 10 to the minus uh, 14 EV range. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how um, so the, uh, the, the major detector can look for that um, in, in a few minutes. And then um, somewhat related is uh, you can use these, um, these atom sensors to look for, uh, for new forces. So this would be like so-called fifth force searches, look for forces beyond the four forces we know. And basically the idea there is if you have a really good uh, accelerometer or a really good uh, force sensor, you can look for, um, for perhaps very small equivalence principle violating forces. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in fact, some of those same, um, the, the models for those same forces can be closely related in fact to, uh, to dark matter candidates that we can look for. And so the, these are somehow complementary searches. You can look for um, uh, the, the, the same sort of models acting as dark matter uh, and, the, or, and or you can also look for that same um, sort of a proposed particle acting as a, as, as a fifth force, for example, sourced by the, the Earth itself. Um, and so, uh, and then finally, I've gone on here sort of a little bit more of a technology point, but something that I think is really exciting um, is uh, basically big quantum mechanics. So uh, as we're developing these long baseline sensors, we're not just increasing uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the so-called baseline, um, the, the sort of the, the overall size of the apparatus. We're also trying to increase the delocalization of the quantum states themselves. And so just as an example of that, I have some data here from um, the, uh, the, the, from, uh, the Kasevich group, the 10 meter uh, atom fountain uh, that was taken a few years ago. And, and in, this, in this work, uh, what, what we did is we took some rubidium atoms and split them by uh, a truly macroscopic distance. So that you 
you're seeing uh, the, the sort of these two spikes, one in the foreground, one in the background, which are uh, essentially, this is a, showing you the probability distribution of that atoms that it, it, when it's in this, uh, this macroscopic superposition state. So having the, having the atom in two places at once, if you like, separated by about half a meter. And so as we continue to increase um, the, the sort of the sensitivity of these atom sensors, we're, we're pushing to split the atom's wave function by larger and larger amounts, and that's sort of uh, um, proportional to the sensitivity that we're aiming to increase. So, um, so, it, so I think this is um, maybe, maybe exciting in its own right. Um, if you're interested in seeing how far we can push this quantum technology, um, does, or, or, or maybe an, I could ask, potentially in a more fundamental sense, does quantum mechanics even let us do this? Can we make human scale delocalized quantum uh, states using massive particles? And so far, so good, we have been able to, but maybe quantum mechanics uh, doesn't uh, work exactly the way we think. And so there are some speculative ideas uh, about modifications even that you could look for or at least constrain with these sorts of um, testing quantum mechanics in these new regimes. Um, okay, so let me come back to gravitational waves and, and highlight a point that I, that I mentioned earlier on uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So first, sort of a, a, a broad uh, survey of the different gravitational wave detectors uh, in, in, across the different frequencies they, they operate in. So this is a plot of the, uh, of the strain sensitivity uh, of, the di of different detectors. So um, out here at high frequencies above about 10 hertz, you see uh, the LIGO detectors, which are already operating. And those go out to about a, a kilohertz or so, and, and lots of exciting sources are already being observed, uh, black hole binary in spirals, neutron star binaries. Um, at, at the lower frequency range you see here uh, is uh, the, uh, the proposed LISA uh, space detector, so, and, and, and that, that, that uh, project is, is, is very far along and will, uh, will hopefully fly uh, in, in, in the next uh, maybe 10 years um, or so. I don't know the exact schedule now, but it's, it's on track as far as I know, so that'll be very exciting for seeing very low frequency sources. But you can kind of see that in this yellow band that I've highlighted, there's sort of a gap between those two, which is what we call the mid-band between about 0.03 hertz and a few hertz, where um, there are actually a lot of really interesting sources. In particular, um, the sources that LIGO has seen, um, you, you may remember, there are these, um, for example, uh, black hole binaries with tens of solar mass uh, black holes, or close to 100 solar mass black holes, um, orbiting each other at, in this case, at least 10 hertz because that's where LIGO starts to cut off. So that's a really aggressive astrophysical system if you've got these you know, ten, ten, you know, tens of solar mass objects orbiting tens to hundreds of times per second. And not surprisingly, they're, that's actually near the end of this uh, in spiral. They're, uh, they're, they're close to merger and so LIGO sees them for a short amount of time before they finally uh, coalesce. But those same black hole systems or neutron star systems that LIGO has seen um, have been um, evolving for, uh, for a very long time and losing energy by emitting gravitational waves and slowly getting closer together and orbiting faster and faster. And as a result, you expect to see those same sources in the mid-band earlier on in their evolutionary history. Before they reach LIGO's band, they would be in the mid-band and they would you know, start off even lower than that. And so this is a great place to sort of see things as a preview for what's gonna happen in, in the LIGO range. And so, um, so let me tell you a little bit about why that is, is interesting for multi-messenger astronomy. So what we'd love to be able to do, and already has been, um, is already been done with, with some LIGO data, you'd love to be able to look at uh, an in-spiral event, for example, a neutron star binary, for example. You'll, you'd love to be able to detect that uh, with LIGO and look at it at the same time with the whole suite of electromagnetic telescopes you have to sort of watch the event in real time, so, so to speak. What's, what's been done is LIGO can detect where events are and then there's been, uh, sort of searches after the fact to try to find uh, what, what's left over after the merger and, and it's been, there, there have been discoveries already finding these, um, for example, in the case of neutron star binaries. And so, but if you could do it uh, better and faster, it might be interesting. And so, um, the, uh, before I tell you about what this, this, uh, this, this picture here means, uh, maybe I'll say a, a briefly how, how LIGO figures out where in the sky a, a, a detection occurs. So LIGO is sort of, um, uh, the, it's, it's antenna pattern, antenna pattern, if you like, is, is fairly um, broad. It, it sees things coming from lots of different angles, so a, a single LIGO antenna by itself doesn't really do a great job of saying where in the sky a source is, but there are, there's, there's more than one laser interferometer. There's two in the US, and then there's Virgo also in, in Europe, and, and so with sort of more than one laser interferometer, you essentially look at differential arrival time. So as the gravitational wave uh, propagates uh, through space and hits these detectors at slightly different times, you look at that time delay, and that tells you, uh, it gives you sort of um, some, with, with some error bar where, where, the, where the, 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 the source must be. 
But uh, it turns out you can do much better in the in the mid band range with that. So and and that's what this cartoon is kind of tr sort of trying to show you here. So the the, the rough roughly speaking, the figure of merit, if you like, for how well you can localize a source depends on uh, the wavelength of the source. Uh, so that, that's lambda would be the wavelength of the gravitational wave in this case, and R, which is the separation between your detectors. So how far apart the two different uh, LIGO detectors are, that sort of gives you the lever arm for how well you can see small angular differences in the in the direction of the gravitational wave. Um, and so, but uh, one interesting fact is that if you have a detector on the Earth, uh, like we're proposing to make in the mid-band range, that detector is going to move around the sun, right, over the course of a year, and that could potentially be a really great way of seeing a large separation between your two detectors as long as the source of gravitational waves persists for many months. And so in the mid-band frequency range, the sources, they, they, they're, they're, they're further apart, they orbit more slowly, but they also last longer, and you can, you can watch them for many months, and that means you can effectively synthesize a, a very large aperture here where you, where you can sort of, it's as if you had a detector on either side of the sun, it's not really just one detector, but you just watch the source uh, over the course of a year, and, and, and you can use that to do extremely good uh, re re resolution in, in, in angle, sort of, so it, unlike LIGO, which is limited to the size of the Earth, you, you're sort of limited by the sort of one astronomical unit. Looks like my screen is, not sure why that happened. So my computer's still up, so it's definitely the projector. It's back, okay. Maybe it just needs to wake up every so often, so I will move the mouse. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so, okay, so, uh, and it turns out with a mid-band detector, um, and you can see some uh, results here, that I, which I won't go into, uh, we, we, we expect it's possible to, to localize sources to better than a square degree using uh, a, a sort of a mid-band detector, which is good enough that you could really expect to see the event happening in real time um, as, the, uh, as the merger occurs. Um, so... Okay, this might be frustrating. I'm not sure what I did last time. <laughs> But it, maybe it's a weak connection. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll go on. So, um, so let me let me uh, let me see uh, how long this lasts. So, uh, so okay. That, that's kind of mo uh, maybe a long intro for, for motivation for why we're building these long baseline detectors. So now I'm going to come back and tell you about how the tech, the core technology works. How how we can use atom interferometry to ma maybe do some of these things. Uh, and so this is a, um, a, an atom interferometer I've shown here, uh, and I, I have a light interferometer by comparison. These are both mock sender geometries where you can split light, send it along two paths, and interfere it. We can do the same thing with matter waves, um, and so we've got here an atom, and we can, if, if we have some way to make beam splitters and mirrors for atoms, we can split an atom's wave function and have there be a lower path and an upper path, just like in a light mock sender interferometer, and that uh, allows us to look at interference between these two different paths uh, at the final beam splitter. You can see an example of a matter wave interference pattern shown here, um, and uh, effectively the, the the phase shift of this uh, of this uh, matter wave interference pattern is, is that's our observable. We're going to we're going to measure by counting how many atoms are in these different uh, ports. We can measure the phase uh, evolved during this interferometer, and that phase is going to tell us interesting things like the force that the atom felt, for example, uh, or or or, or um, effects due to gravitational waves, etc. So. But how do we implement these beam splitters, right? So, so with the mock center in front with light, it's straightforward. We've got you know mirrors and, and, and beam splitters made out of made out of matter to split uh, and manipulate light. Uh, for uh, for a matter wave, we're going to use beam splitters and mirrors made out of light to manipulate matter. So it's sort of the roles are reversed, um, and so uh, the the sort of two. Um, principles that we use to implement um, these, uh, these beam splitters and mirrors, these so-called atom optics, uh, are, uh, are light absorption and, and stimulated emission. Uh, and so essentially you want some way to um, influence the motion of an atom um, using light, and we can do that by, uh, by absorbing and emitting photons. So if I send in a laser to an atom, this is my picture of an atom, it's a two-level atom, so there's sort of a ground state in blue and an excited state that'll be in red, and I start off in the ground state. If I send in a laser beam, and it's tuned to be on resonance with the atomic transition, that atom can absorb a photon. And since light carries momentum, momentum h bar k will be absorbed by the atom. And if the atom has mass m, that means it has to be moving after that absorption by some recoil velocity h bar k over m. So that's how we can give the atom a kick. Uh, we can do the reverse process, which is stimulated emission. If I'm in the excited state already here in red, and if I send in light, um, we, we, the atom will emit into the laser beam and give up that energy and come back uh, to the ground state and, and be once again at rest. So these two processes are conjugate. We can use them uh, together to make beam splitters and mirrors. Um, and sort of uh, the, uh, the tool that we use for that is, is called Rabi oscillations. So essentially, we turn on our laser, 
And you see here the evolution of the quantum state as a function of time that the light is on. Uh, so if, we've, if we look, for example, at the, uh, uh, at the red curve, that's sort of the, pop the population in the excited state. We start off at zero. There's no atoms in the excited state. But as a function of time while the light is on, we see this sinusoidal oscillation of the population. So we start off in, 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 the, in the ground state. And then if we wait a, a duration equal to the so-called pi pulse time, we'll end up in the excited state and vice versa. Um, so that's how we make a mirror. We, that's how we sort of take away or add a photon uh, of mo with a momentum to the atom. We can also make a beam splitter simply by waiting half as long. And that's a so so-called pi over two pulse, which puts us right here. And that would put us in um, an equal superposition of these two states. And that, that's how we implement this sort of initial split. And I'll tell you later how um, we'll um, make these, uh, add even more momentum to the atom using large momentum techniques. But this gets us there uh, for starters. Um, so um, typically we do these experiments with freely falling atoms. So this would be like, for example, in uh, the 10 meter tower here at Stanford, we have uh, a vertical vacuum pipe. And you can see the atom here is a blue little dot. And we, we, we toss the atom up, and it, it's in free fall for a couple of seconds. Um, and then we implement the matter wave uh, interference experiment, or the atom interferometer sequence, by, by shining laser pulses shown in these little red arrows. And uh, we implement this uh, pi over 2 pulse to split the wave function. And we wait some time do a pi pulse to reverse the relative velocity of the two arms, and then do a final pi over two pulse at the end. And then we can measure then the phase shift there. And uh, I just want to make a couple of points here since I wanted to tell you about, in addition to scaling up the size of these devices, making them longer and longer baseline, how we increase the sensitivity. The fundamental sensitivity uh, it essentially is proportional to the space-time area enclosed by this, uh, by this diagram here. So what that means is that you want the duration to be, uh, to be long, so lo and, and, that, and that's what motivates sort of very long vacuum pipes. So you can drop the atom for a long time. But uh, critically, you also, if you could, you'd really like to, to, to increase uh, the wave packet separation. So if you look at, at time t, that's when the, uh, the matter wave uh, um, is in, in, in this um, superposition state where you've got part of the wave function here at point B, part at point C, and that's separated in space by some distance. And the bigger we can make that distance, the more sensitive we're going to be. Um, and so what, what we can do for that is increase the relative velocity of the, uh, of the two arms using multiple laser pulses. So um, I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a second. So, uh, but in, for, for, for first, the, the along the dimension, on, along the time axis, that's where uh, where we get these long towers. So you see, this is a, a picture of the of the um, the 10 meter drop tower in the Kasovitz lab. You can see the vacuum pipe here in this uh, um, in this pit here in the basement of Arian. Um, but really, this uh, this field is is has been a, be starting to, uh, to 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 spread out in in, in a good way in, in in recent years. You can see a number of other experiments have started up with sort of 10 meter scale atomic fountains, including um, a, a new project in in the UK, uh, an atom interferometer in in Germany, and then uh, and also in in, in China. Uh, and each of these is sort of uh, sort of I think not as far along as as the work here at Stanford, but it's exciting to see other groups sort of pursuing this. Uh, the goal of, of being able to drop the atoms for a long time to increase sensitivity. And then, uh, so that's for a long time. We also want to do large wave packet separation. And so I want to say a little bit more about this. I already showed this data on the, on the, on the intro slide about s sort of making meter scale or half meter scale wave packet separation. Um, and so the trick here, and I'll, and I'll say more about this um, hopefully at, at the end, um, is uh, to, to increase the wave packet separation, we want to use um, as many pulses as we can to transfer uh, lots of momentum to the atom. So you can see uh, what, a, what the pulse sequence for one of these so-called large momentum transfer atom interferometers looks like here. So sort of sandwiching between the, 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 the sort of normal pi over 2, pi, pi over 2 pulses are these gray bands where we have a series of additional pi pulses. And each of those pi pulses is designed to transfer extra momentum to one arm of the interferometer. And so that you can see that in the space-time diagram, we've really stretched out this interferometer by applying many of these pi pulses. Each one gives this little black dot here and adds, in this case, an additional 2h bar k kick to the upper arm while leaving the lower arm uh, unaffected. And that in this, in this work, we were able to transfer up to 90h bar k of momentum with sequential pi pulses. And that led to, after about a second of free fall time, this, uh, this data here. So this is another view of it. So we've got uh, this sort of spike here and another spike there. Those are the two um, halves of the atom's wave function. And they're separated, in this case, by 54 centimeters. And that's still a record for, uh, for matter wave delocalization. Um, 
So, uh, and, and, and what my group's been doing is, 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 is trying to sort of translate some of this to these, um, to these clock atoms that I mentioned earlier. This, this work was done with rubidium, and so hopefully we'll have time at the end, I'll get to tell you about how to push to these same sorts of momentum, momentum transfer using, using strontium atoms, and some of the um, maybe interesting advantages that that might, might have. Um, okay, so, uh, good, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more about um, how we can use atom interferometers to actually implement a gravitational wave detector. Um, so here's uh, my picture of a gravitational wave. You've got some binary system spiraling around, uh, emitting gravitational waves. They propagate over a long distance and they arrive at your detector. And so uh, a simple way to, to think about a gravitational wave detector is this little cartoon here on the right. So I've got these two black dots which are supposed to represent um, some kind of inertial test mass. So they could be, um, they could be you know, any massive particle that's just following a geodesic. They could be rocks. They could be, in our case, they're going to be atoms. In the case of LIGO, uh, the way these, these test masses are implemented are uh, using um, really fancy mirrors. So this is uh, a picture of the LIGO interferometer. And so you, you have on each arm of LIGO a a, uh, the, the, what they hear, here is called the test mass. It's a it's a it's a mirror that's suspended um, and isolated from from ground variations by by a fancy isolation stage. And those two implement the, the, the these two test masses. Um, so if you've got two test masses following, they're, they're geodesic and unperturbed, then if a gravitational wave comes by, the way that you can measure that is by looking at the distance between these two test masses and looking at fluctuations in that distance. Uh, and so uh, that, and that fluctuation is proportional to the strain of the gravitational wave. Um, and so one thing I wanted to want to mention here is if you look at this kind of cartoon here, we've got these two test masses and, and arguably that's all you need, that is all you need to detect a gravitational wave. Just look for a fluctuation between that distance. Um, and, and the way LIGO measures distance, if you like, is using the light travel time. So we send, 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 send light down and it bounces back and forth between these mirrors. You measure how long it takes. And if that time uh, of flight of the light is varying, then you can attribute that to a gravitational wave. So in principle, you should only need one arm of LIGO to to implement this sort of simple gravitational wave detector. And in, in, in principle, that's true. In practice, it's very difficult because uh, you would need the laser itself to uh, be, be basically be very quiet. So if you have a noisy laser, that can kind of uh, be, be confounding. Um, and so in order to uh, avoid that technical noise source, LIGO uh, has an auxiliary arm. So there are two arms that are identical, and they send the same noisy laser down two arms and uh, then compare them interferometrically. And basically, that just suppresses the laser's noise. Uh, and, and and the gravitational wave acts uh, sort of differently on these two arms. It's, uh, it, it stretches one while it, while, it, uh, um, while it compresses the other. And so you, you, you sort of, uh, the signal survives that, that subtraction. But it's, uh, in principle, if you didn't have, if you had a perfect laser, you could get away with a single arm to do gravitational wave detection. And I want to take advantage of that fact when we're thinking about how to use um, atoms to do uh, gravitational wave detection because I'm going to tell you about an approach that basically tries to realize this, this simple cartoon with just two test masses. So if you like a single arm gravitational wave detector. And that's something um, I argue is possible with atoms that, is, um, that, that, you, that the current blue can't do yeah, using light. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and that the, 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 uh, the technique that we'll use to realize that uh, we call MAGIS. is the Matter Wave Atomic Gradiometer Interferometric Sensor. And so it's an atom interferometer based approach. And it, it's going to use two atom interferometers, as we'll see in, in a minute. Um, and the atoms themselves are on each end of a long baseline. The atoms are going to play the role of the test masses. And uh, so that's sort of one of the ingredients you need for, for a gravitational wave detector, as, as I've been describing. You need something that will follow geodesic really well, so the atom can be a, a good test mass. The other thing you need is some way to measure the distance between uh, the, the, those two test masses. Um, and if you're measuring the, the travel time of light, as is done in LIGO and as is done in MAGIS, you need essentially a really good clock. And as I started off telling you about, since atoms can be really good clocks, we have the possibility of basically letting the atoms play both roles of uh, both of these two ingredients can be, can be realized by, by the atom. Um, so if you like, uh, this is sort of one way to think about it. Um, in, in, in LIGO, the test masses are, are mirrors. They're, they're, they're sort of passive. They're just a, a chunk of glass. In MAGIS, as we'll see, uh, the atoms themselves are, are sort of like an active proof mass. They have an internal quantum state that, we, that we're manipulating with the pulses of light. And that uh, gives us the possibility to uh, 
essentially cancel off this laser noise because the, the atom will actually remember what the what the what the noise uh, what what the what the what the phase of the laser is, and if the phase is noisy, we can we can cancel it off using that atom essentially as a, as a memory of that. So it's sort of like an active version of the LIGO proof mass using the internal degree of freedom. Um, so okay, but let me let me see if I can make this a bit more concrete. So this is sort of a, a little uh, animation of how you could use atom interferometers or atomic clocks uh, to realize a gravitational wave detector. So um, so here we have a uh, an atom. Uh, I'm showing it here as a clock, but just imagine these two clocks are they're, they're atoms, and uh, I've just got um, uh, and the way we'll realize uh, the the atom is or, or, or I'm, what I'm thinking of here for 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 a clock. I'm, I'm thinking about this, this two level atom here with a ground state and an excited state separated by some energy um, omega a. And so to start the clock, uh, we, we need to put the atom in a superposition of these two states. So, uh, and, 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 and we're going to have these, these separated by a long baseline once again because we want to look for sort of gravitational waves that stretch the distance between these two clocks. Um, so um, we'll start off with uh, a pulse of light. It's going to propagate across the baseline, in this case from left to right. And you saw that when it, heats, when it hits each atom, it puts the atom in that superposition 50-50 between the ground and the excited state. And that's essentially like starting the clock. So now if we let time evolve, that superposition state is going to evolve phase. The excited state has a higher energy by omega a, and that means the clocks are ticking as we stay in that, excited, in that superposition state. At some time t later, we might want to stop the clocks, and so we'll send a second pulse across. And the phase evolved during the, the interval between those two pulses. Um, I'm here calling omega a times t, so if t is the time spacing. And you see here nothing interesting has happened because both clocks read the same time. They're, they both evolve the same amount of phase. Now, it, I'll, point, I'll, I'll run this one more time. It's critical to notice, right, the clocks stopped at slightly different times, right? The, the, the near clock stopped before the far clock. But that's actually the same thing that happened at the beginning. We started the clock on the left before the clock on the right. So even though uh, when they start and stop is, is slightly delayed due to the finite time it takes the light pulse to propagate across the baseline, the uh, the, the, the overall phase evolved is, is equivalent. There's been the, 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 same, uh, the, the same time spent in the superposition state for these two clocks. So this would be, if we compare these two clocks and make a differential measurement between the two, we would measure zero, and that is sort of saying that sort of nothing interesting happened. However, what if a gravitational wave were to come by during this evolution time? So between the first pulse and the second pulse, gravitational wave comes by, it slightly stretches the distance between the two atoms. What that means is that this second pulse has further to go to reach the far clock. And so we're going to keep ticking over here at, um, at, at a rate omega a and by, for some additional time delta t, which is the extra time it takes the light to cross. Um, and in this case, if the baseline stretched due to the gravitational wave with strain h, we'll, we'll, we'll have an extra time hl over c that we're evolving on this clock. And so then now there's a non-zero phase difference. And so that's really the whole, that's the whole mechanism how we detect gravitational waves is look at those slight time delays due to the extra distance it takes the light to cross the baseline. Um, now, as I mentioned, the, uh, the laser itself doesn't have to be perfect here because if this laser is imperfect, the way I think about that is it has, it has some, arbit some random uh, phase associated with this, this light pulse that maybe is jittering in, in time. Um, that phase is also going to be written onto the quantum state, it turns out. And so when I compare these two clocks, that noise will cancel as long as these two clocks are seeing the same pulse of light. Um, Good. So uh, now in practice, we want to do a little bit more complicated of a pulse sequence than just this two pulse sequence that I just showed you. And so you can see what that looks like here over on the right. This is um, a, a set of two atom interferometers. They, they look like Mach center interferometers like before. There's a lower atom interferometer and an upper interferometer, and they're separated by some hopefully large baseline. Uh, so that would look like this sort of uh, in, in real space. So this is the vacuum pipe here in cross section. You see one atom cloud, the other atom cloud. And now these blue atom clouds, they really are you know, sort of playing the roles of those two black dots I showed before and we're looking for fluctuations between the two and we're going to measure that by looking at, at the differential arrival time of the light, the time it takes the light to, to, to cross between the two. Now, in order for this to work well, um, we want to accumulate phase as fast as possible, and that's what's motivating the use of these, uh, these clock atoms, which have uh, an optical transition of separating the two levels, so a very high frequency omega a, which lets us accumulate phase quickly and have very high timing pre precision. Um, and so the phase shift, roughly speaking, as I showed before, it's, it, it's given by uh, this energy splitting omega a times the, the light travel time across the baseline. Um, and and, uh, uh, and, and what, what, 
what you can see is, in fact, this, this gives me a way to, to talk about dark matter as well. So there's, there's sort of two ways this phase shift can, can vary. I've been telling you the story about how a gravitational wave can cause the phase to vary. So if L varies due to a gravitational wave, that would be delta L equals H times L. We could see that. But another thing we could see in this, in this sensor would be if uh, the clock frequency itself varied, right? So if omega A itself, that, that's the splitting between the levels that we're in a superposition between, if that was a, a function of time, uh, then we could see that too. So, and it turns out dark matter can, can cause that sort of fluctuation, as I'll, as I'll, as I'll say now. Um, so, so dark matter, um, a couple different uh, types we could talk about. So uh, I'll sort of distinguish what I'll say from, from, from um, sort of some WIMP dark matter. So WIMPs are uh, sort of particle-like dark matter that, we, we, that, ha that has been uh, uh, looked, looked for, for for many years. Um, you can think about these as uh, particles with um, sort of roughly 10 GV or so uh, worth, worth of, of mass. Um, and the uh, uh, you could look for these by looking, for example, for how much energy they deposit in some detector and, 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 uh, and so forth. So this kind of the picture I have for this is little billiard balls flying around. Um, if you think about uh, reducing, if you, if you think about what dark matter could be though, there's actually a, a wide variety of models that, that people are interested in. So th this, uh, um, the, the, the WIMP dark matter is, is, is perhaps the best motivated candidate for dark matter, but there are other um, masses that dark matter could be. Because in fact, if you think about what we know about dark matter, the one thing we sort of are sure about, essentially, is, is that th there's a certain mass density out there uh, that uh, we can measure in a number of different ways. But how that mass density is distributed, like between whether there's a lot of particles with a small amount of mass or very few particles with heavy mass, is an open question. And so you could, in, instead of imagining these very massive particles like this, you could have extremely light dark matter uh, where there's just actually a, a huge number of them. And when you start piling up more and more of these dark matter particles, at some point, the particle description starts to become maybe less useful. And there's so many of these that they, the wave functions of the, these particles start to overlap in this way this kind of indicates here. Um, and, and so we call this sort of wave-like dark matter. And you can see here some examples of, uh, uh, well, there's a number of different uh, candidates that could could, could play this role. Um, and this, this plot here is sort of showing how as a function of the mass of, of the dark matter, this is for an axion or axion-like uh, particle, for example, you can see that um, depending on what the mass of the of the of, of, of this uh, particle is, there are different technologies that uh, people that, that, that have been identified that could be used for uh, for detecting uh, this wave-like dark matter. And sort of at, the, at some of the lowest uh, masses, which correspond to sort of really low Compton frequencies, the atom interferometry approach um, could be could be really uh, useful. Um, and so. An example uh, we, we can look for with, with these atom interferometers would be an, an example of a scale, like a scalar field, for example, that, that uh, can couple to our atoms. So this is uh, um, showing the, uh, the dynamics of that here. So this the scalar field here, phi. Um, and so uh, you, can, you, you can write down uh, the free field uh, for, for this. So this uh, looks like a plane wave. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 the field here, I'm not talking about this, this ultralight dark matter as a field, it oscillates at a frequency given by m sub phi, which is the mass of the particle. So uh, that's the frequency we're going to be looking for, set by whatever fundamental physics determines, um, the, the, or whatever fundamental physics tells us the, the, the mass of this dark matter particle is. Um, and then the, the amplitude of the field is proportional to whatever the local dark matter density is. And so, uh, so that's sort of the free field, but it can also couple to matter in a number of different ways. For example, it can couple to the electron or it can couple to the photon uh, with different uh, strengths. So, so DME and DE, these are sort of some, um, um, some, some coefficients that tell us how strongly the dark matter is coupled, and those are unknown. We don't know how, uh, how big those couplings are, and that's essentially what we'll be trying to measure by performing these experiments. If you have a non-zero coupling uh, to either electrons or photons, for example, that can perturb the energy levels of atoms. So here is that our, our same two-level atom before with splitting omega a, if there's a non-zero coupling, um, then this field will perturb the energy spacing. And you can see here the, the energy levels are now wiggling. And they're going to wiggle at a frequency given by however, wh whatever frequency the dark matter is oscillating at, which is given by its mass. So that's the signature. He's looking for an oscillating omega A. And, and as I showed, the sort of uh, the long baseline um, gradiometer, uh, in addition to being able to see gravitational waves, can also look for these, uh, these perturbations in the, in the energy of splitting of atoms. 
Okay, good. So uh, now a number of groups around the world have started to put together uh, programs to build up long baseline sensors. So I'll tell you about Magus in, in a little bit more, Magus 100 in a minute, but I just wanted to highlight that, as I said, there's sort of a growing field, uh, which I think is really exciting to see. So uh, in France, for example, there's the MEGA project, already under construction. Uh, there's a, a project in the UK called ION, uh, which aims to, uh, to collab, to, in fact, to, to, to sort of um, run simultaneously with Magus, uh, our, our, our detector, and so, so we can cross-correlate data streams. And then, and then, and then finally, uh, there's also uh, Zyga, which is in China. Uh, they're, they're, they're now, as I understand, uh, drilling holes in mountains uh, with, with, uh, to, to make these uh, very ambitious uh, long baseline uh, atomic sensor. And if you look at this chart here, you can see that um, there's sort of a variety of different approaches being taken, different kinds of atoms, different orientations even. Some of these are horizontal, some of them are vertical, uh, different sizes, but they're all around 100 meters scale and so that's sort of the next step that uh, as a field we, where we're taking there's these 10 meter machines I showed you a few already and now we're scaling up to uh, 100 meters in the in the aim of eventually getting to a detector uh, big enough to detect uh, gravitational waves um, so Mages 100 is the is the detector that I'm uh, a part of and that, that and, and and you can see uh, sort of what that looks like here so uh, this is a, uh, sort of as, as Peter mentioned earlier, it's, it's international collaboration now. We have 10 uh, different institutions involved. Um, and uh, it's going to be at Fermilab. You can see uh, a cross-section of uh, the Fermilab campus here. And uh, we're taking advantage of an existing um, access shaft that they have, 100 meters vertical uh, shaft there. Um, and uh, you can see what that looks like here. This is a kind of cartoon of that. We're going to put our vacuum pipe along the length of that access shaft and attach atom sources at the three locations uh, shown here so that we can sort of implement uh, uh, these long baseline atom gradiometers. And so MAGIS will look for um, a number of different, I think, exciting science targets. So uh, we, we, can, we, we, can, we can probe for dark matter in unexplored uh, coupling strengths. And we're going to really be pushing the, uh, the, the quantum technology by making bigger and bigger wave packet separations and longer and longer, and longer drop times. I'd like to be able to drop an atom from one atom source down to the other if possible, like a 50 meter drop, or maybe even longer. Could we, could we launch an atom from the bottom 50 meters or maybe even 100 meters? These are some of the things we'd like to try. Um, but even just operating atom interferometers uh, on each end, separated by 100 meters, is already exploring the science that we'd like to do with these long baseline uh, sensors. And then finally, I should mention, um, you know, this is, uh, this is not going to be big enough to detect gravitational waves, as far as we know. The gravitational waves are, are really hard to find. They're really, 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 really weak. Um, but it, it is an important step towards scaling this technology up towards the kilometer scale, which is where we think we need to be to detect gravitational waves. So this is kind of a Pathfinder experiment in that regard. Um, so in terms of sensitivity, you can see um, the, 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 uh, what we hope to do for MAGIS 100, uh, both uh, in gravitational waves and in, in dark matter. So um, in gravitational waves, you can see the strain sensitivity here sit sitting between LISA and LIGO in this blue band. There's a range of different sensitivities we think we can get to using sort of starting from our sort of the state of the art technology a couple years ago towards sort of ultimately what we think is possible with a 100 meter uh, device. And I think in anything in this range is already going to be setting records for strain sensitivity in uh, this frequency range. Uh, but you can see there's actually, since there is a lot of, 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 of space colored by this blue band, that really indicates um, the work we can do at a given length scale, 100 meters here, to improve the intrinsic sensitivity of these devices, um, including using these large momentum te transfer techniques that I'll, um, I'll, I'll say some more about in a minute. Um, in the dark matter space, um, the existing bounds on, this is a, a coupling due to, uh, this is a, a, once again an ultralight scalar. We can look for scalar coupled and vector coupled candidates uh, for, for, for dark matter. This is a, um, an ultralight scalar coupled um, to uh, the mass of the electron here. And you can see compared to these gray bands here, Majors 100 is carving out uh, new space that hasn't been ruled out. And so we potentially have some discovery opportunity there um, for looking for, 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 for dark matter. And then this is a, a vector coupled example um, where you see there's actually a wide range of space that we think we can, we can um, explore with, with uh, MAGES 100. Um, so the detector itself is, uh, is pretty mature in terms of the design. Uh, you can see, uh, well, this is the, the, the shaft itself where we're going to attach the atom interferometer. 
At the top of uh, the mage detector, we have uh, a laser lab that, we're, that we, we, where we generate the interferometer uh, light, and it's sent across and then down into uh, the 100 meter vacuum pipe. Um, the vacuum pipe itself is made up of 17 modular sections, each uh, about five meters long. You can see uh, one of those here. Each modular section consists of the ultra high vacuum chamber, uh, magnetic shield, and let's see. I don't know what's going on, but I apologize again for the unreliability of this. And then you also saw a picture of the atom source on there, which I'll... I don't know if it's my connection or what, but... So I, I was going to show you some... I'll show you a picture of... Yeah, here we go. So let me just jump to this then. So um, I want to show you some of the work we're doing at Stanford to realize uh, the, uh, uh, this, um so some prototype work we've been doing for mages. So the, the, this is a cross section of the mage detector where you see the vacuum pipe and the magnetic shield shaped like an octagon. And so we built a couple of these modular sections here at Stanford uh, over this over this recent summer. So you can see what one looks like here. There's a, it's a vacuum pipe uh, with uh, some um, bias coils and um, bake out equipment attached here. Um, and we, we verify we can get the vacuum we need, etc. Uh, and then you hear, see it here uh, with the magnetic shield installed and tested, we were able to achieve uh, the target magnetic field in this test setup. So the, we, we know how to build these modular sections. We just have to make a lot of them now and install them uh, in, the, in the shaft. Uh, in terms of atom sources, we're going to have three of these atom sources. We built two already here at Stanford, which we think of as prototype strontium sources for, uh, for Magus. You can see close up what one of the vacuum chambers looks like. Uh, next steps are to take this hardware and integrate it into a, uh, a nice in, uh, environmental enclosure. So that this, this envelope here is going to have um, protect us from the elements. Uh, deep underground, it's, it's, uh, we can get rained on. There's water seeping through the walls and things like that and so we're going to make sure they're all protected um, and so that's work we're going to be doing here over the next year as we prepare to take these uh, out to Fermilab. Um, Long term, uh, where, where can this where can this, this work at Mage 100 take us? Uh, the the full scale detectors have I think really exciting uh, science opportunity in the gravitational wave uh, space. So you can see here this is now a full scale detector uh, shown in green uh, in, in 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 terms of strain sensitivity, uh, and it's coming down low enough that you're able to see and you know shown here in red and blue uh, LIGO sources that have already been observed, and so we'll be able to see uh, some of those with the terrestrial detector. It's also pretty exciting uh, to consider the same technology in space, potentially. So Mages 100 is a pathfinder uh, not only for future terrestrial experiments, but also for a potential satellite mission. And there you see the, sort of the, these two different envelopes. We, we, can, we can see here with a broadband detector. And, and, and here in brown, if we use sort of resonant enhancement, we, we can look at, at, at different frequencies with the, the sensitivity shown here by this brown envelope. So there's really... In, in that case, an incredible amount of discovery potential in this uh, with with this approach. Um, I think I'm getting close to the end of my my time, uh, and I am not getting close to the end of my slides. So uh, unfortunately, I won't get to tell you too much about uh, the. Um, our, our recent large amount of transfer results, but I, I will maybe steal a few minutes here to highlight some things if, if, uh, if people are interested. So um, I, since I've been promising it the whole time, I, I want to get to it a little bit. So. Uh, um, so we will. So um, as I've already shown, we, we, we want to split these wave functions by as much as possible to increase our sensitivity. And the way we do that is by using as many pulses as we can to split the atom's wave function. Um, and so in strontium, we want to sort of translate the work we've done in rubidium that I showed that just a, a second ago with this 50 centimeter uh, wave packet separation to the strontium atom. And uh, we want to use these clock transitions to do that. And so once again, here's our strontium level diagram. And there's sort of two levels that are interesting. So the, the, the best clocks in the world are done on this 698 nanometer transition that has this 100 second lifetime, and that's what we want to use for Magus. But it turns out there's this nearby transition here uh, to the level, one, one level higher, to triple P1, which is, um, we, we say it has an intermediate coupling strength. So it's not as long lived as the clock transition, uh, but it's about a thousand times longer lived than a typical atomic physics transition, which lives maybe nanoseconds. This transition lives for microseconds. So it's sort of right between the, the two and it gives us the opportunity to try um, some, uh, another approach to this clock atom interferometry. Uh, and it turns out, we, we, so we, we decided to explore that transition because it would be easier, we thought. Uh, it, it's the, since it's a not as narrow a transition, the, the, your, your technical requirements are easier. Uh, but it turned out to be interesting in its own right, not just as a proof of concept, but also as maybe an, an interesting approach to doing um, quantum sensing. So, uh, so we tried that. 
a few years ago, uh, and, and, and implemented the f first version of one of these large momentum transfer sequences using uh, one of these sort of uh, these, these, these two level systems that I'm calling clock transitions. And so a cartoon of that is shown up here. So uh, once again, we're sandwiching between uh, our pi over two, pi, pi over two pulse, a sequence of additional pi pulses, which are gonna increase the momentum separation between the two arms. Um, and so you see you know, the, the, the trajectories are kind of splitting, in this case by up to 11 h bar k after that series of pulses. Um, the key thing I want to highlight here is that the advantage that we had in this, with this particular transition, this sort of intermediate language transition, is that its coupling strength is high enough that we're actually able to talk to both arms of the interferometer at the same time with each laser pulse. So if I highlight, for example, this last pi pulse, just for, for example, which is propagating you know, this way, um, the two different colors of the, uh, show the, the atomic state. So we're, we're starting off in sort of the red and the blue state on the two arms, respectively. Um, and when this pulse uh, flies by, the atom that's in the ground state, the, the lower arm, can absorb a photon. And it's gonna then get going by one h bar k faster when it does that. But the other arm is in the excited state, and when the pulse comes by, it can undergo stimulated emission and go back to the ground state and get kicked in the other direction. So that pulse is gonna give us a net of two h bar k momentum transfer when it hits the, both arms of the interferometer. Um, now, I should say, very importantly, that that's a bit simplistic because actually, if you think about it, these atoms, once they start uh, splitting, they're, they're gonna be at different velocities. One's moving you know, upward, the other's moving downward, and so there should be a Doppler shift. And so in fact there is, and these two different arms of the interferometer are not, at the, they do not have the same resonance frequency in the lab frame anymore. One is Doppler shifted up, the other is Doppler shifted down. So it shouldn't be possible, you would, you'd think, to be on resonance with both of these transitions, and that is in fact true. So what we've done is we've sort of split the difference. We put the laser right between the transitions, and the reason that it works is that the, since the coupling strength is so strong, we, can, we have enough bandwidth essentially to talk to both arms simultaneously. You, you can think about the pulses, the, the, uh, the coupling is so strong, the pulses are short enough that their frequency width is broad enough to encompass both of these Doppler shifted arms. And so that, that's a great trick. It gives us twice the momentum kick per pulse that we would have otherwise had. And that um, was what we did in this early work. And you can see, see that work, oops, uh, here you can see the, the, this is a, the atom interference fringe that we're scanning. So it's the population in one of the ports of the final interferometer. As we scan the phase, we see with the one H bar K interferometer, the expected um, constructive and destructive interference between the, 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 the two paths. And here you see an orange uh, 51 H bar K version of that where we've added a bunch of additional pulses. And we can still see contrast. We still see this variation um, as we scan the phase. But it's not as nice, right? You can see there's uh, less contrast. It's, it's, it's a smaller oscillation. And in fact, there's also more, fa more phase noise. So um, summarizing all that, you see a, a, the, the, our results from this early work. Uh, we show the, I show the, I'm showing here the contrast of the resulting interferometer as a function of the momentum separation. You can see it's decaying here, this green, these green data points. So as we add more and more pulses, we're losing contrast. And, and, and uh, um, however, nevertheless, we were able to push this and see um, over 140 h bar k momentum transfer, um, which I was really excited by because this is the first attempt that uh, anyone had tried with large momentum transfer interferometry on a clock transition. And even though it was the first attempt, we actually set a record, that's the highest uh, momentum transfer that um, had been done with the sequential pulse technique. So very good sign. But I'm not happy though, it, it's decaying and, and we're not going to as high as we'd like to be. I'd like to ultimately put, push this to like a thousand H bar K if I could. So how do we go from here to there? So I've identified a couple different loss mechanisms. There's spontaneous emission. If the pulses are shorter, that would help. And we can do that by increasing our laser power. But there's also sort of this Doppler shift issue that I mentioned. And you can see uh, sort of that kind of illustrated down here. If you see the interferometer contrast, this blue curve is showing our theoretical, theoretical expectation for the contrast as a function of momentum separation um, if all we had was spontaneous emission loss. And you know, it's following this exponential decay. But when you include Doppler loss, you see that at first, my story works, right? I can talk to both arms of the interferometer. I'm not having, I'm not worrying about the Doppler shift. But as the velocity of the two arms gets bigger and bigger, eventually they just start detuning enough that it starts to hurt you. And you have this sort of even faster roll off when you count for Doppler loss. And that's really what's killing us in this, uh, in this early work. So we, we set out to try to uh, suppress that Doppler shift by uh, developing an, an, this, this new technique, which we call flow K atom optics. So I think um, I'm, uh, 
going to use another few minutes uh, of time here. We, we have maybe five more minutes, and then, and then I'll let you all go. I know there's food waiting, so I don't want to go too long, but I wanted to just kind of, kind of set the stage for this, at least, and then I'll show you the results. So, um, so there's sort of, uh, sort of three different regimes that, that we can think about when we're ta talking about the Doppler shift so, uh, of, the, of these interferometer arms. So the first story I told you is in the so-called strong coupling regime, when the coupling strength is so much bigger than the Doppler shift that you don't even care. And that's shown here in the, frequ in the sort of a frequency picture of that here. So here's our laser sitting at, 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 at once again uh, at, at, on resonance in the lab frame. And the two interferometer arms, arm one and arm two, are shown symmetrically split plus uh, by, by the Doppler shift, plus omega d and minus delta omega d. Um, but as long as the coupling is strong, you see here the frequency width of the pulse in blue, it's broad enough that we can efficiently talk to both arms. So that's a really easy regime to be in. That's the first results we did. Now, if the Doppler shift gets really big, then uh, you can get in this so-called weak coupling regime, where the Doppler shift is much, much bigger than the, than the, than the Robbie coupling. In that case, uh, you're not going to be able to play this trick anymore. And so what you can do instead is put a single frequency so you can, you can run your laser at two different frequencies simultaneously. So these black arrows are now my laser frequency. And if I put each frequency component on resonance with the respective interferometer arm, um, I can just address them um, sort of simultaneously and independently. So you can see them in blue here once again is the envelope of the, of the pulse. And you can think about these just as happening in parallel. There's no crosstalk. Um, so as you increase the number of pulses, you split the Adams wave function more and more, you're eventually going to go from the strong coupling regime to the weak coupling regime as the Doppler shift gets bigger. But to do that, you have to go through the intermediate coupling regime where it's on the order. And that's when things get tricky, uh, where the envelope is broad enough that you're actually getting crosstalk uh, between these two frequency components that we're going to try to use. So you can see now I've put the two laser frequency components at a different frequency, not on resonance, but slightly off at some frequency beta. And each of these frequency components is actually going to going to talk to both arms. And so we set out to see, you know, is there a way to use this to, um, nevertheless, even with this crosstalk, to try to get efficient transfer. And so I'll skip over some of the Floquet theory stuff in the interest of time just to show you the result here. Um, so this is the data we took um, of our, uh, of our uh, in, in, with, with, with the, two, the two different Doppler shifts that you have in the atom interferometer. This is arm one and arm two. And you see here uh, the population of the, uh, of, 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 the, of the atom as a function of time. And, and this, this is normally would look like Rabi oscillations, but what I want to focus on here is that uh, it looks more complicated now, right? So now we have this sort of, the, the, the atom's population kind of goes up for a while, it reaches this intermediate peak, then it kind of dips for a bit, but then it comes back up. And uh, that's a result of, in this intermediate coupling regime, we have sort of more complicated dynamics. The two frequency components are both kind of participating in uh, affecting the atom state. But nevertheless, we're able to, we've been able to find some parameters that, that, we're, we, that we use in this case to, to still get uh, with, uh, with nearly 100, with like over 99% efficiency to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, um, to, to the, to, from the ground state to the excited state. And that's happening sort of symmetrically for these two arms in this case. And you see that illustrated here on the block sphere. So um, as, we, uh, as we look here at the, uh, as the state of the atom on the block sphere, it starts off on the south pole. And these, uh, these arrows here, we call the torque vector, sort of by analogy with uh, sort of spin precession here and, and the influence of an external torque. You can, you can think about the atom as processing around these torque vectors. And since we're modulating uh, the coupling using this, uh, this sort of periodic drive here, uh, we're able to, um, even though we're initially missing going over the top of the block sphere, since the coupling kind of flips around, we can bring them back uh, to the North Pole. Um, and so, uh, so I think I'll just um, skip to the summary here. So using this sort of modulated uh, atom optics, uh, we were able to sort of get rid of the, the, this Doppler shift uh, and, or suppress the effect of it substantially. So you see this is once again an interferometer uh, fringe as a function of phase. So in blue, uh, we have um, the, uh, the sort of with, with, these, with these modulated pulses that are compensating for the Doppler shift, we get a, a, a pretty nice looking fringe. And you can see if you don't do that in gray, there's actually a very small, uh, but almost like only 2% uh, contrast uh, fringe there. So it's substantially worse if you don't compensate for the Doppler shift. And that's sort of summarized here. So we were able to, uh, to push out uh, to much higher, uh, uh, out to over 400 h bar k using these so-called flow k pulses. Um, and if you don't compensate, you know, you're sort of uh, getting to only about 200 in this case. So, so this really allowed us to push to much higher Doppler, sh uh, much higher uh, uh, momentum transfer using, um, using this approach. 
And so just in, sort of to summarize here, uh, I, I, I told you about um, the work we're doing with long baseline uh, quantum sensing in MAGES 100 uh, and uh, how we're building this 100 meter interferometer at Fermilab and it's sort of acting as um, hopefully a pathfinder for a future full scale detector, uh, both um, uh, terrestrial detectors and maybe uh, also uh, space based versions where we can have a baseline long enough to see gravitational waves. And then sort of complementary to this work uh, is, is work in scaling up the sensitivity of the interferometers, uh, and, and one of the key in, uh, steps there is uh, is increasing the momentum transfer, as, as I described, using these flow K modulated pulses. That's sort of one approach that we've been exploring. And so we've got about 400 H bar K now, and uh, we think uh, in the near future we should be able to push that to maybe 1,000 H bar K, which would be, uh, I think, a pretty exciting milestone. So uh, with that, I should. Uh, um, should, should, should end there, and I wanted to sort of call attention to the sort of uh, long and growing list of collaborators uh, on the MAGES 100 project uh, and all the different institutions that are part of that, and in particular highlighting uh, my team here at, at Stanford on, on the Strontium Interferometer uh, project. So, so thanks everybody uh, for your attention. Other questions for Jason? Yeah. So uh, uh, obviously the, the laser interferometer guys are going from ground-based with LIGO to LISA with like million kilometer baselines and no seismics and things. Is there a simple reason why there has to be a gap in laser interferometry or is that a technical choice? That's a good question. I think that there have been um, there are ideas for how you could, yeah, do optical potentially in the uh, in, in that inter intermediate range. I, I, I think there's been some studies on that. So, I, but the the uh, one of the key things you'd, for for like a satellite mission, you'd want to make sure you had good performance on the, the so-called the gravitational reference system, the GRS, so that they, they have to do drag-free control to isolate the proof mass. And so that would need to be, you know, make sure that that works at the at the higher frequencies. Um, and uh, you would need to sort of design the mission with that frequency band in, in question, so different baseline to probably a shorter baseline, so uh, to, to, to for a, a LISA-like approach. Um, it's worth looking at, I would say, and, and uh, um, uh, I think the Atom approach offers a number of potential advantages or maybe trade-offs uh, you, you, you could think about. Um, I mentioned the single baseline uh, idea as, as an example, right? We, we can realize this with, with two test masses separated along one direction, so that would mean that if you did a space mission, as in the cartoon I showed here, you could imagine sort of two spacecraft ranging along a single axis, which is, you know, not three, could be nice, so that's that's one potential advantage. But but I think that uh, it's 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 a good question. I think it's worth looking at whether um, you you could do atoms at other frequencies as well. Like but but with the, the mid band is I think a place where it looks like a pretty good match for this technology. So yeah. Do you have a Yeah, so I guess it, the, the, for MAGES 100, I guess, or for any of these long baseline detectors. So the, the question is, like, do, do we have to worry about the, the fact that as the light propagates up the, 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 the shaft, maybe the, the frequency is, is red shifting? This is the... The light and also the, uh, also the atoms that are acting as clocks. Right, yeah. So I think that um, I might turn that around and say that would be an exciting thing to measure. I think we could, we could, we could, we could look to, 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 to test for that. I, I, I don't, but I think the scale of that is, is uh, small enough that it won't affect our ability to implement the interferometer if, uh, as, a, as, a, as an error. One thing we do have to worry about uh, is the gravity gradient of the Earth, right? That that, that, that that does affect the rate at which the atoms are falling in the upper interferometer versus the lower interferometer. And there is some, you know, you have to account for the fact that the uh, that the uh, um, as as they're falling, they're 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 Doppler shifting, as I've been describing, and so if the rate at which they're Doppler shifting is different, then you know the pulses might not be exactly on resonance for the two um, the two interferometers. So we've we've had to think about pulse sequences that can address simultaneously two different uh, interferometers that are just separated by you know at different velocities. Uh, so but but the re the redshift doesn't hurt us in terms of uh, being able to implement the interferometers, and it could be an interesting thing to observe. Yeah. 
Mom gets hurt. Are you doing it? Which one? Jason, you told us uh, lots about the science prospects for mages, but I was wondering actually whether you could say a little bit about, you know, with this record setting and the large momentum transfer right here in the lab at Stanford, yeah. um, are there exciting positions? Yeah, I, I think I think that uh, in particular, I, I mentioned oh, there was a bullet that, that uh, I think this is a pretty interesting um, platform potentially for, uh, for for like a, a practical sensor. So this might be a, a way to make a gravity radiometer uh, with um, sort of uh, which has which has some nice properties. So we, we can by using like an efficient large momentum transfer interaction, we could, uh, for example, you know uh, you know me measure measure the Earth's gravity gradient or gravity gradients of, of of, of surrounding masses. Um, an advantage of, of this technology compared to sort of other approaches is um, since we're able to use this intermediate coupling transition, we have, strong, we have a pretty strong coupling. We don't need to have the, the atoms as cold as, as you would in a typical large momentum transfer application. So for example, if you're using um, Bragg transitions in, in alkali, you would want to be fairly cold typically in order to have that be efficient. Here we have megahertz of, of bandwidth on the on these transitions so we can have uh, very efficient uh, interaction even if we have f fairly hot atoms. So that, that, that suggests a simplified cooling protocol uh, potentially, if, if you were to think in terms of a practical sensor, right, you wouldn't have to make a BEC. You could do, use like laser-cooled atoms, um, and the laser itself wouldn't have to be as maybe as controlled in, in a gradiometer application. So I think that there's some technological te technology applications. I am excited about also for fundamental physics regions. So we can absolutely imagine in, uh, using these uh, on the 689 transition to implement large momentum transitions, uh, even in mages. Uh, the, the the caveat is that the the, the travel time between if the atoms if, when it starts getting long in these long 100, base, 100 meter uh, baseline uh, applications, you're going to worry about spontaneous emission loss. So it wouldn't be great for a gradiometer where you're separated by 100 meters, but I think it could be interesting uh, in an EP type measurement, like an equivalence principle type measurement, where you had two different isotopes co-located. And even in a 100 meter uh, vacuum pipe, you could let them fall for a long distance. You can have the pulses arrive within a short enough duration of each other that the spontaneous emission is really no different than what we've done here in, 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 in the lab here. And that would work at, at, at Magus or even in our, in our, in our tower here. Um, one thing I didn't get to mention is that um, it, it's straightforward to do a large momentum transfer sequence on this intermediate transition, get a large momentum separation, and then um, actually put both atoms back into a stable state where you do, do not, don't have loss due to, because the, the state only lasts for 20 microseconds. So we get the transition done in sort of hundreds of nanoseconds or microsecond, and then put both atoms, shell both atoms in the ground state, and then that can last for as, essentially as long as we'd, we'd want. And so you could, you could imagine that working in Magus as a really nice way to, to do LMT. And the, the, We've already demonstrated, but but I I don't think it's good for the for the gradiometer application, the long baseline gradiometer. So, what is the like, scale for actually being able to do astrophysics with these detectors, like compared to say ESA or uh, like next generation? Yeah. So the question is about time scale for, for astrophysics applications. So when do we think we can see gravitational waves? It's like, like when are we going to go, basically? So uh, it's a good question. So um, so MAGES 100, the, the, we're, we're planning to commission it in, in 2024. And, and then uh, I think that we have a lot of science that we can do there, uh, a lot of work to do there. Um, but I think over the next five to 10 years, we, we would be um, aiming to propose and start to develop a, a sort of the, a full scale detector. Um, and, and I think um, it's, it, and I, I sort of outlined two directions that could go. Sort of, we've already looked, started to look into possible sites for, for kilometer scale detector. They do exist, and, and there's a number of mine shafts that you can use for that. And, and frankly, satellite detection might be a pretty viable option too. Um, but you know, there, there are trade offs. So I think that, that looking, you know, 10 years in the future here, we, we could be in a position where we're starting to build those detectors. And, and that, that, I think that'd be a path I would, I would be aiming for. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's a tough, it's a tough uh, thing to do, as, as you, I'm sure, know. And, and so I think we're in a similar place as LIGO was when they, when they were building these sort of, these sort of prototype machines. And, uh, and hopefully we can learn from th that process from them. Range of axial masses are you sensitive to? 
is like a factory or something. And the second one is, uh, could you say a bit about what you do about the seismic noise? The seismic noise, yeah, okay, the first question was about uh, what axion frequency or axion-like particle frequencies, uh, let me see, if maybe I can point to this chart here um, as a place to, to aim for, so, it, it, and, and I forget the, 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 uh, right. So that, and, and so that would be that th this blue this blue curve here is an example of a given interferometer with a given transition. What range of frequencies it can see, and so you can see that it's mostly sensitive at like 10 to the minus 15 eV, so roughly hertz Compton frequencies for that particular set of. Oh, oh, in terms of the mass range. Uh, you mean, oh, oh, is that, so why? Yeah, so that, I would say it is about a factor of 10 for this particular so, coupling. Yeah, it, it, you arguably, you know, it could be, so there's, actually, I didn't get into this, but there's actually sort of two different detection modes we can use here. So this upper plot is the story that I told, which is this sort of gradient, this sort of long baseline detector, gravitational wave-like detector. Um, this plot is actually a sensitivity curve that we get uh, using two different isotopes co-located. And, and that, that there, you know, there, there's arguably maybe a couple orders of magnitude of, of mass range. So, so between one and two, depending on the, the strategy that we're using. And th this low frequency cutoff is just set by um, our uncertainties on, 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 on low frequency systematic errors there. So th this is just, yeah. So, yeah. The other question is noise. So seismic noise was the other question. So uh, good. Um, yeah, so maybe this is a good chart to point out for that too. So seismic waves, noise can come in in a couple different ways. I mentioned LIGO's isolation stages, so it just it can just directly shake your test masses. Our analog of the LIGO isolation systems is that our atoms are in free fall, so we don't have to worry about that direct coupling on the atom. It does, the seismic noise does impact the lasers. All the delivery optics shakes the lasers, and, those, and that I would to talk about that as, a, as phase noise on the light delivered to the atom. And that, I, I've argued here, is as long as that same pulse that leaves that last mirror hits both atoms in a, in, in a similar way, that noise can be suppressed by comparing the two atoms and looking at their differential um, phase. However, that's not the full story, as you know, right? There's also so-called gravity gradient noise, so and Newtonian noise, in which is something that LIGO um, has, has, has pointed out. And, and that was this gray, uh, this orange line that you can imagine being there. Um, and, and so that's essentially that uh, even though we aren't directly coupled and maybe we have the suppression, the, the vibrating uh, dirt around the experiment due to seismic noise couples to us gravitationally, and that gravitational coupling isn't easy to shield or can't be shielded, right? Uh, and so, uh, uh, so the uh, and so that orange band that was on there is showing our, our estimated uh, limits due to gravity gradient coupling to the atom, right? So that's you see it's slicing off some of the sensitivity that we'd be able to see at major 100 because at some point the, the, the seismic noise is causing gravitational uh, noise that it's bigger than our, our, our aim sensitivity. Now, that's not the whole story because um, we think that there may be a way to actually measure and subtract this to some degree, and that's in fact the motivation for having three atom sources at MAGES 100. This is a this is you know a, 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 this is a, a, something we're going to try. We don't know how well it work. The idea is that uh, gravitational waves are a planar excitation. They would they would affect. Uh, all three of these, t they would stretch space sort of in a linear way, but uh, the Newtonian noise um, is sourced from local uh, test ma local mass that's shaking around, and so it has sort of a Newtonian-like potential, one over R type potential. And so, in principle, if you have more than two, so I only I, instead of just having one on each end, if you put an additional one in the middle, for example, you can now start to measure curvature across the baseline, which would be uh, the result, for example, of, of, of Newtonian fluctuating Newtonian potential. And so, I imagine a full-scale detector actually instru instrumenting mages with a number of atom sources along the length to try to measure higher order variations in the in, 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 in fluctuating phases that would correspond to gravity gradient noise. And if you can measure that and subtract it, you may be able to push this down maybe by a factor of, 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 of 10 at the, we, we, we estimate. Uh, it, it's hard to say how well it will work. And that would maybe let you go a little bit lower in frequency than otherwise you'd be limited to. Uh, this is also very site dependent and it's base length dependent too. This is actually for mages, for mages, for kilometer scale uh, mages, this would be a, a 10 times smaller because it's, it's, it, the strain sensitivity is what we care about, not the force, which is what this looks like. So there's a number of reasons to be optimistic for a terrestrial detector, but this is one of the, this will limit any terrestrial detector at lowest at the lowest frequencies, this gravitationally, uh, this gravitational noise. And that's, in fact, one of the best reasons, I think, to go into space, is to get away from the vibrating Earth. So thank you for that question.
that's probably a good place to stop. Thanks, Jason, again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look at this. It's like <laughs> yeah, well it was showing on the screen. Yeah, I know. So it's not my computer. It's yeah, this cause this thing knew about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I'm I'm it's very bizarre. Sorry about that. We're gonna have to tell somebody. Cause yeah, because your 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 slide was still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was obviously